Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss and Tal Raz. Summary and Key Ideas Do you ever find yourself in a negotiation where you feel stuck or unable to make progress? What if I told you that you could learn how to achieve better outcomes in your negotiations, whether with a business partner, a customer, or even a friend or family member? With ideas presented in the book, Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if your life depended on it, you can take your deliberation skills to the next level. Even if you think you'll never need negotiating skills, you need them, sometimes daily. Just think. Maybe you're trying to convince your boss to give you a raise, or you're haggling with a car salesman over the price of a new car, or maybe you're a freelancer trying to land a new client, or a parent trying to get your kids to do their homework. You now see it, right? In this video, we take a closer look at Never Split the Difference, authored by Chris Voss, a former FBI hostage negotiator, and co-written by Tal Raz. We will talk about Voss's five techniques of understanding others' emotions, tapping into emotions during a negotiation, and how cognitive biases affect the negotiation. Also, we will cover the three different types of negotiators, how to know when you are dealing with a liar, and most interestingly, how to determine black swans which are essentially hidden pieces of information that change the outcome. Let's get started. First of all, let's define the phrase, never split the difference. So the idea behind the phrase is that in a negotiation, you should never settle for a compromise that splits the difference between your position and the other party's position. Rather, you want to find a solution that effectively meets both parties' needs and interests. Let me share an example to illustrate this. Suppose you're negotiating with someone over the price of a used car, and you're asking for $10,000 while the other party is offering $8,000. In this case, splitting the difference would mean settling on $9,000. However, according to Voss, this approach can leave both parties dissatisfied and harm the relationship. Let's now talk about Voss's five techniques for understanding emotions. According to Voss, when negotiating with someone, it's important to understand their emotions and make them feel safe with you. He calls this calculated empathy. To use calculated empathy, Voss recommends five techniques. 1. Active listening. This technique involves paying close attention to what the other person is saying and demonstrating that you're engaged and interested in their perspective. For example, if someone tells you that they're feeling frustrated with a particular situation, you might respond by saying, I understand why you're feeling frustrated. Can you tell me more about what's been bothering you? 2. Using the right tone. Tone can have a big impact on how someone perceives you, and using a light and encouraging tone can help put the other person at ease. For example, if you're negotiating with someone and they make a suggestion you don't agree with, you might respond by saying, I see where you're coming from, but I'm not sure that's the best approach. Let's explore some other options together. 3. Reflecting. This technique involves paraphrasing or summarizing what the other person has said to show that you're actively listening and understanding their perspective. For example, if someone tells you that they're feeling overwhelmed by a particular task, you might reflect back by saying, it sounds like you're struggling with this task and feeling like you don't have enough support. Is that right? 4. Emotional labeling. This technique involves identifying and vocalizing someone else's emotions to acknowledge and validate them. For example, if someone expresses frustration with a particular situation, you might label their emotions by saying, it seems like you're feeling frustrated and like your needs aren't being heard. Is that right? 5. Accusation audits. This technique involves preemptively acknowledging and addressing any negative perceptions or accusations that the other person may have about you. For example, if you're negotiating a salary with a potential employer, you might start by saying, I know that you might be concerned that I don't have enough experience for this role or that I might not be the right fit for your team, but I want to assure you that I'm committed to growing in this position and contributing to your organization in a meaningful way. Now, Voss also suggests giving your counterpart a sense of control over the situation. He recommends asking open-ended questions with, how or what to achieve this. For example, if you're faced with an unreasonable price, you can ask, how am I supposed to do that? To prompt them to come up with a solution. 
Once you've established a connection with your counterpart, it's important to elicit the right responses from them. Surprisingly, Voss warns that a yes response can be misleading because people might say it just to end a conversation. Instead, he suggests asking questions that prompt a no answer. Saying no can make someone feel in control and help them set boundaries. To get them to say no, Voss suggests asking questions designed to prompt negative answers, such as mislabeling their emotions or asking what they don't want. Let's see how you can bring others around to your way of thinking. So, the first telltale sign that you're making progress in winning someone over is when they say, that's right. But how do you get them to this point? Voss recommends summarizing what they've said in your own words, as it shows that you really get it and helps them feel heard and understood. And once they say, that's right, you can use that to commit them to your preferred course of action. But how do you get them to commit in the first place? Well, Voss says you need to tap into their emotional needs for security and autonomy. One way to do that is by changing their perspective and showing them that by helping you achieve your desired solution, they'll actually satisfy their hidden wants. Voss also warns us about deadlines. Your counterpart might try to use them to pressure you into making a deal, but Voss argues that deadlines are almost always arbitrary and rarely trigger the consequences we fear. Michael Lewis describes in his book Moneyball how Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland A's baseball team, used the trade deadline to his advantage by taking advantage of desperate teams looking to offload star players in exchange for anything of value. By exploiting the time crunch, Bean was able to acquire top players while giving up very little in return. Now how can you exploit cognitive biases during negotiations? He talks about two specific biases. The framing effect and loss aversion. Essentially, the way information is presented to us can impact our decision-making. For example, marketing milk as 99% fat-free versus 1% fat can influence whether health-conscious consumers are more likely to purchase it. Also, people tend to fear an equal loss more than they value an equivalent gain, which is something you can use to your advantage when negotiating. Now let's say you've agreed with your counterpart but you're not sure if they'll follow through. Voss suggests using open-ended questions to keep them engaged and committed. By asking questions like, how can we ensure that we follow through on what we've agreed to today? You're making your counterpart feel like they're part of the solution. Another interesting thing Voss mentions is that you can observe your counterpart's language cues and speech patterns to see if they're truly involved in the decision-making process. For example, People who deflect third-party pronouns like we instead of saying I or me may not be the ones in charge. However, it's important to note that this isn't always a clear indicator, as people in positions of power may also use this tactic to avoid being pinned down to a specific position. Finally, what do you do when you're dealing with a liar? Voss says that liars tend to use more complicated, rambling sentences and rely on third-person pronouns to distance themselves from the lie. However, it's important to distinguish between a liar and someone who is being strategic. Keep asking open-ended questions and paying attention to tonal and nonverbal cues to help you spot the difference. Moving ahead, another important aspect of a successful negotiation is bargaining. According to Voss, bargaining is more than exchanging offers and counteroffers. It's about understanding the deep psychological currents that drive our hidden wants, fears, and desires, and those of our counterparts. The first step to becoming a good negotiator is constructing an accurate psychological profile of your counterpart so that you can be better attuned to what they're really looking for. Voss identifies three main types of negotiators, givers, calculators, and aggressives. Let me tell you more about each. 1. Givers these are individuals who enjoy pleasing others and are highly sociable and agreeable. However, they often struggle with time management and may agree to tasks or commitments they cannot realistically fulfill due to their eagerness to make others happy. 2. Calculators These individuals are known for their methodical and diligent approach to decision-making. They prefer to gather all the relevant information before committing to a course of action and are typically not swayed by time constraints or deadlines. 3. Aggressives 
These are achievement-oriented individuals who prioritize productivity and efficiency. They place a high value on meeting deadlines and minimizing wasted time in order to maximize their output. Regardless of which type of negotiator you're dealing with, you need to be prepared and have a plan. Before you head into a negotiation, think about your open-ended questions, how you're going to reflect back, and your labels. You can also use specific dodge and counterpunch moves when facing down a seasoned negotiator. These include dodging tactics and counterattacking techniques. Just to get into more detail, dodging tactics are essential techniques you can use to avoid your counterpart's punches during a negotiation. One way to do this is by asking open-ended questions that allow you to say no without using that word explicitly. Another strategy is to shift the focus to non-monetary terms. For example, ask, can we put the price aside for a moment? What other benefits could you offer me that would make this deal more appealing? When negotiating, knowing how to counterattack without losing your cool is also important. Chris Voss suggests a technique called strategic umbrage, where you get angry but remain in control of your emotions. This means directing your anger toward the offer being made rather than the person making it. For instance, you could say, I'm afraid there are no circumstances that would make what you just proposed work for me, in a firm but composed tone to express your displeasure. But perhaps one of the most crucial aspects of negotiating is having information. In every negotiation, there is some hidden piece of information that, if known, would completely transform the dynamic and the final outcome. Voss calls these pieces of information black swans. To find your counterpart's black swan, Get FaceTime to pick up verbal and body language cues, exploit the similarity principle by building a rapport with them, and creating a conversational, even confidential, atmosphere. Ultimately, knowing your counterpart's black swan gives us key insight into how they see the world. Now, what do you think about Voss's Never Split the Difference? If you ask me, I'll just say that it's one of those books that you know you needed only after reading it. Anyway, let me know your thoughts in the comments section. While at it, like the video and share it widely. Check out the 30-day free trial audiobook in the description, and remember to subscribe too for more content like this. Thanks for watching.